For millennia, well-educated people believed the Earth was flat and placed at the center of the universe enclosed there with a protective covering. In the early 16th century, Nikolai Copernicus introduced a different model of the universe in which the Sun lay at the center and the Earth revolved around it. Copernicus' heliocentric model is taught today while the earlier geocentric model has been utterly rejected. Less than a hundred years later, Galileo was persecuted by the Catholic Church for promoting Copernicus theory and forced to recant his beliefs and spend the last years of his life under house arrest. Galileo's persecution for promoting heliocentrism is surprising as the Catholic Church initially supported Copernicus theories. Consider the following facts. 1. While some sources claim Copernicus never took the vows of a priest, he was a cleric and never married. Furthermore, the fact that in 1537 King Sigismund of Poland put his name on the list of four candidates for the vacant episcopal seat of Ermland makes it probable that, at least in later life, he had entered the priesthood. When Pope Paul III sought Copernicus for advice on how to reform the calendar, Copernicus at first demurred to answer. Later, he wrote a series of letters to the Pope containing accurate observations that actually served 70 years later as a basis for the working out of the Gregorian calendar. 3. For a long time, Copernicus refused to publish his beliefs on a heliocentric universe. Finally, in 1531, he published a brief abstract stating his theory in seven axioms. From this, the concept spread rapidly. 4. Two years later, Albert Windmanstadt lectured on the Copernican model before Pope Clement VII, an action for which he was richly rewarded. 5. In 1536, Cardinal Schoenberg, who was Archbishop of Capua, urged Copernicus to fully publish his theory or, at the least, have a copy made at the Cardinal's expense. 6. Between 1539 and 1541, Copernicus published and distributed a 66-page letter and a preliminary chapter. 7. Copernicus explained in a letter to Pope Paul III that he finally yielded to the insistent urging of Cardinal Schoenberg, Bishop Gies of Com, and other knowledgeable men, and agreed to publish his manuscript. Copernicus' theory of a heliocentric universe was well known at the upper strata of the Catholic Church in his lifetime. While he preferred his theories published after his death, he ultimately agreed to publish his manuscripts on the persistent appeals of high church officials. Catholics were not first to reject Copernicus' views, for they themselves admit opposition was first raised against the Copernican system by Protestant theologians for biblical reasons. The Catholic Church advanced Copernicus' heliocentric model, constantly urging him to spread it abroad, together with other theories that opposed the sacred scriptures. The Roman Catholic Church was waging war on the new Protestantism believers having come from their own system, while Copernicus was resisting appeals to publish his theory of a heliocentric solar system. Under the approval of Pope Paul III, the Jesuit order was established in 1540, and Copernicus dedicated his book, Revolutions of the Heavenly Bodies, to this very same Pope. This newly formed order, the perfect instrument to implement a clandestine operation for the Pope of Rome, began changing the public perception of the authority of the scriptures, 
the Earth and the Creator, they became infamous for their skill at deception and subterfuge, their ability to infiltrate governments and institutions of learning, their standing as advisors to kings and new leaders in education, the very influence they wielded was tantamount to becoming humanly insurmountable. Working through government entities and in the field of world education, they guide scientific research to further their own ends and present the biggest lie of all time, a globe Earth. Then I got a little bit deeper into this and thought about a spinning globe 666 in the strong delusion. In my Babylon Rising series, I pointed out some correlations to Nimrod. Nimrod ben Cush, when you do Nimrod ben Cush, the, the numerical value of that is 666. There are lots of other things uh, in his incarnation as Gilgamesh, who is said to be one third man and two thirds God, one third man. Looking at the spinning heliocentric globe, 666 keeps popping up. Speed of Earth's orbit. If you look it up, uh, it'll either tell you in kilometers or miles per second. When I looked it up, uh, it was kilometers, converted it to miles, and saw that it was 18.5 miles per second. Well, you multiply that times 60 seconds to get minutes, 60 minutes to get an hour, it's 66,600 miles an hour. That's how fast the Earth is supposedly going around the sun. Curvature of the Earth, when you do the math to figure out how much the Earth is curving, 25,000 miles circumference ball, using the Pythagorean the theorem, you end up with eight inches per mile squared, which is the first mile is eight inches. The curvature is eight inches in one mile. Eight inches is 0.666 of a foot. 10 miles is 66.666 feet. 100 miles, 6,666.666 feet. Starting to see a pattern here. <laughs> Earth's tilt, look it up, 23.4 degrees, 23.4 off of center. Well, 90 degrees, right? 90 subtract 23.4, 66.6. Is it just a coincidence that so many of the numbers related to our spinning heliocentric ball just so happen to be associated with the beast? Following Copernicus' publications, it is probable the Jesuit order has produced more astronomers than any other demographic in Europe. That, ostensibly, a religious order should produce so many scientists should cause surprise. However, as these scientists have focused nearly exclusively in but one area, this gives us reason to question. The Catholic hierarchy had the perfect opportunity to lay groundwork for a global deception to culminate in this Earth's final generation. This deception required a globe Earth spinning throughout the vast reaches of space, space inhabited by aliens and other sentient life forms. These contrivances created doubt in the Bible putting science ahead of scripture, which advises mankind the earth is enclosed and unmoving. They also place the creator far away from his creation by presenting a universe unimaginably vast. Upon rejection of the sacred scriptures, which teach us Earth is a fixed, immovable object under a protective covering, a nefarious foundation was laid. Atop this were built perversions designed to force humanity to doubt the very word of our father Yahuwah. With the biblical geocentric model rejected, a new explanation was required. A globe Earth its orbit of the sun for millions of miles every year, illimitable realms of space with billions of galaxies, each composed of billions of stars with worlds innumerable. All this became necessary to explain the new heliocentric model of the universe, and mankind over a short time lost his divine significance. Thereafter was created an environment 
within which the writings of Charles Darwin found a receptive audience. Once science showed the Bible wrong, the disparager then diverged from her religious guise altogether. Anything suddenly became possible. There was nothing above question, including how the earth seemed to appear in the vastness of space with all else and the existence of extraterrestrials. Numerous researchers have established incontrovertible connections between the Vatican and the Nazi Party. Regardless of the level of collaboration between the Vatican and the Nazis, what happened after World War II is even more significant. Operation Paperclip smuggled hundreds of Nazi scientists, including top SS officers on trial for war crimes, into the United States for use in America's Cold War space race. One of these Nazi Party members, Werner von Braun, was promoted to head up NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Under Operation Paperclip, some 350 German scientists and former intelligence agents were given visas and well-paying jobs. Many of these scientists had questionable pasts. Braun himself had been an active member of the Nazi Party and his colleague at NASA, Dr. Hubertus Strugold, a specialist in aviation medicine, had performed experiments on concentration camp inmates. The purpose of this massive and illegal undertaking appears to have been for the establishment of a worldwide authority on all things relating to space and astronomy. NASA became the public face of space. It has long acted as a front providing an unsuspecting world with pseudoscience legitimized by the backing of the US government. NASA is its own monopoly. It controls the dissemination of public information on astronomy while hiding facts it does not want the public to know. While many countries and universities have observatories, always it is the statements, photographs and discoveries of NASA that make the news headlines. With NASA in charge of the flow of astronomical information to the public, it appears the Vatican has remained a central player in the truly accurate astronomy not being released to the public. For hundreds of years, the Vatican has owned more telescopes and observatories than any organization, private university or government. NASA and the Vatican jointly own Lucifer, the world's largest binocular telescope. According to the official Vatican website, the Vatican Observatory is one of the oldest astronomical institutes in the world. And yet, where are the photographs? Where are the news releases of the latest discoveries? Precisely what have the Jesuit astronomers been doing for the last 500 years? Only The Big Bang Theory is, today, the leading explanation about how the universe began. At its simplest, it talks about the universe as we know it, starting with a small singularity, then inflating over the next 13.8 billion years to the cosmos that we know today. Priest Andrew Pinsent holds advanced degrees in theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome as well as a doctorate in particle physics from Oxford. In January 2015 he wrote, Being both a priest and a former particle physicist at CERN, I am often asked to give talks on faith and science. Quite often young people ask me the following question, how can you be a priest and believe in the Big Bang? 
to which I am delighted to respond. We invented it. Or more precisely, priest Georges Lemaitre invented the theory that is today called the Big Bang, and everyone should know about him. The author of the Big Bang Theory was none other than the Jesuit-trained priest Georges Lemaitre. On October 28, 2014, Sarah Kerr reported, Speaking to members of the Pontifical Academy of Science, the Pope said it is possible to believe in both, insisting God was responsible for the Big Bang from which all life evolved. Follow from cause to effect. 1. Without a globe Earth circling the Sun through the far reaches of space, we do not have the Big Bang. 2. Without the Big Bang, we do not have evolution. 3. Without evolution, we are more likely to accept creation as an act of intelligent design by a divine creator. NASA's public release of information promoting the idea of an expanding, thus ever larger universe of incomprehensible size has led to the supposition there must be alien life on other planets. After all, if the Big Bang produced life on Earth, why couldn't intelligent life have evolved elsewhere? In combination with Hollywood and the science fiction genre, NASA has created an environment in which contact with extraterrestrial life forms is both fearful yet desirous. A recent book may hold the key to understanding the final steps in this long conspiracy to delude the final generation. Authors Tom Horn and Chris Putnam recently published a mind-boggling book in which they allege the Vatican actively seeks extraterrestrial life with their new Lucifer telescope. The book Exo Vaticana, Petrus Romanus, Project Lucifer and the Vatican's astonishing plan for the arrival of an alien savior asserts the Vatican is waiting for an extraterrestrial savior. In researching their book, Horn and Putnam were granted permission to visit the observatory on Mount Graham, which hosts the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope, VAT, in September 2012. Not only were they able to discuss the study of deep space with the Jesuit astronomers there, but they also gained access to one of the top Vatican astronomers in Rome. Horn said brother Guy Consolmagno, who has also been called the papal astronomer, told the authors some astounding information during five interviews. He says without apology that very soon the nations of the world are going to look to the aliens for their salvation, said Horn. Consul Magno also gave the authors private Vatican documents which reveal much of the thinking of high-level theologians and astronomers within the church. Horn said these documents show that they believe that we are soon to be visited by an alien savior from another world. These statements are not that shocking when the Vatican's ever-evolving stance on science and space is understood. On May 12, 2014, Pope Francis expressed a willingness to baptize extraterrestrials who indicated a desire for baptism. While the comment was clearly tongue-in-cheek, it made international headlines, this one crowing, Cool Pope is so cool that he is willing to baptize Martians. The net effect? It removed the idea from science fiction and transferred it to the realm of possibility. Talking about it as if it were possible gives rise to minds more accustomed to the construct.
Okay, Rob, so what? Why is this stuff important? Well, I hear that question a lot. So I came up with about five reasons off the top of my head why I think this could be important. Genesis is the foundation of all that we believe in the Bible to be true. If Genesis is wrong, then it all crumbles under a faulty foundation. Genesis says nothing, zip, zero, nada, about the earth being set in motion, orbital or rotational, around the sun. In fact, the sun doesn't even show up until after the earth is already in place with life already in existence. Genesis says the sun, moon, and stars were placed inside the same firmament within which the, that earth was formed, not outside of it. Thus, we have a completely enclosed system within which the sun, moon, and stars move, not the earth. Number two, if what we are seeing concerning the flat enclosed earth thesis is true, then we are all there is. We are center stage. We are the main attraction, and there can be no argument as to whether or not there is a creator. None. His existence could not possibly become more blatantly obvious than in this model. Three, if the flat enclosed earth thesis is true, evolution goes out the window, and the theory of ancient alien cedars is obliterated. In this regard, I believe we become painfully aware of the great deception and will not be fooled by it. Four, if the flat and closed earth thesis is true, then we cannot ever trust NASA or the government about anything, and we will finally be forced to fully trust Yahuwah's word as our sole source of truth and stop trying to bend and manipulate it to fit false paradigms. Five, if heliocentricity is false, then scripture is true. If scripture is true and can thus be taken literally, why should we not take it just as literal when it describes the earth as fixed, not moving, set on pillars, a foundation of pillars carved as a circle with edge borders inside something with four corners inside enclosed under a dome? Something to think about. And there is not a single scripture you can use that even remotely supports a spinning heliocentric globular earth in an ever-expanding universe. And I'll go back to the trump card for me was all the stars are falling to this place, to earth. Somebody's lying. For me, it became a matter of faith. I still have questions. You know, you guys maybe ask me questions. We have some time here. I probably don't have the answers to them. I got, many, I got more questions than I have answers. And there's things that, some things I think I figured out, and there's many more that I haven't figured out. And there's always a yeah, but for whatever you do figure out. So I just, you know, if we're in a sea of lies, the only compass I have is the word of God. And it has never failed me. I'm 47 years old. Not once has it ever failed me. And it has taken me through some very difficult times. And is God a man that he should lie? No. And it says that he esteems his word above his own name. And when you read how much he wants his name to be known, that's saying something. He wants his name known in all the world, not substituted with a title, the Lord. That's not his name. He wants his name known. But he esteems his word above his name. So I've just taken a position I'm like, okay, Lord, that's what your word says. I'm going to accept it. You know, come what may. I started to think about the great deception, the great delusion. Scripture talks about there's going to be a, such a great deception that's going to come in the end times. Who brings the great deception? Do you know? That's right. God does. Many people uh, think that it comes from Satan. Now, I think Satan certainly capitalizes on it, no doubt. But it comes from the Father. Why? Well, Scripture tells us why. Second, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. The coming of the lawless one, who is the beast, who is the Antichrist, will be accompanied by the power of Satan. He will use every kind of power, including miraculous signs, lying wonders, and every type of evil to deceive those who are dying, those who refuse to love the truth that would save them. For this reason, God will send them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. Then all who have not believed the truth, but have taken pleasure in unrighteousness, will be condemned. He sends the delusion because people would rather live in lawlessness. They would rather follow the beast. When I started getting into Torah and understanding Torah and reading like Deuteronomy, in chapter 12 in particular, where he specifically says, do not learn the ways of the heathen. Do not worship me the way the heathens worship their gods. Like <coughs> Christmas, <coughs> Easter. <laughs> Things that I used to love. I used to write, direct, and play Jesus in passion plays on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Christmas plays. I was a mall Santa. <laughs> I can believe that. 
And if God says, if you're not going to listen to the truth, if you'd rather follow in the ways of the, uh, the, the lawless one, fine, I'll give you a great delusion. Could this be it, what I've been talking about this evening? I don't know. It seems like a really good fit to me, though, especially with all the associations that add up to 666. Hello, McFly. Right? I don't know that it is or not. But I'll tell you this, the responses that I have received from people have shocked me. It's one thing for somebody to say something and you disagree with them. It's another to go completely psycho when you do. And people that I have talked to who are otherwise very friendly, passive, pastoral, you know, nice people have gone literally insane in front of me, getting very angry. And that's what said to me, I'm going, man, there must be a spiritual component to this particular subject. For people like that, that I would never in a million years imagine to get so upset to react the way they did. Again, I don't know that this is it or not. But it sure is adding up to, yeah, I think it could be. And I just came to the conclusion for myself that... You know what, I, how long are you going to waver between two opinions? I'm just going to have to make a choice. And it's going to be a choice based on belief. Yes, I have plenty of other proofs and things that I have done that have helped along the way. But for me, it came down to let God be true and every man a liar.